during the time I was at Silvermine, it was a tumultuous time in the world. We were changing all the mores. There was a huge change in the generations. We were trying to end a war. The second year, not only was there a huge change in the whole outside world, but the whole second year my mother was dying. And it affected my artwork deeply because th there was all this dying and whenever I did get to work, I put my whole heart and soul into it. I remember drawing her when at the end and thinking, I can't draw well enough to capture her, but this is my only chance. We didn't have cameras in the same way then. And I remember trying to draw her and trying to be so much more of a better artist than I was. And it pulled something and deepened me. Um, there was a sense of immediacy. Um, so there were many deepening factors at Silvermine and I left a completely different person than I entered. Uh, what happened after you left? Um, the two, I, at the end I was a really good student and the two options for good students were Yale and Cooper Union. And my dad had gone to Yale and there was a lot of baggage with that. And I applied to Cooper Union and I got in. So I moved to the big city and went to Cooper Union, which is another long story. <laughs> and um, because of my father, my mother was gone by then, requirements. Um, I finished, he wanted me to go to a name school, so I finished at Pratt, and then he required that I go to Pratt Graduate School. Um, I painted, at, at Pratt I went for four years only doing my major because they credited me with some of Silvermine and some of Antioch and some of Cooper Union. So they said, if you, if you do two full years in your major, which ended up taking, maybe it was two, anyway, so I just painted for, for years at Pratt. And then at the graduate school, I went through the regular graduate MFA program. It didn't have the intensity that uh, Silvermine had, but I developed more as an artist, and it became part of my daily fabric. But it, it was very intense because I had to work. Um, I had to w work my way through and um, pay for my apartment. And I think that was the beginning of realizing that my life had changed and I was committed to a path. Um, how long uh, did, didn't you move back to the city at one time? I moved to the city to go to Cooper Union, and I got um, a great tenement on 11th Street, and the rent was $60 a month. And I remember making the decision when all my friends were living uptown in good neighborhoods and having nice jobs, I said, I don't want to be a slave to an apartment. I want to be an artist. And so I'm going to get the cheapest place I can and fix it up and, um, you know, do whatever I can to keep body and soul together so that I can do art. I didn't realize that I'd actually made a very big life decision. And I lived that way. Um, for my whole life. I did whatever um, jobs, a lot of them were in the arts, a lot of them were wonderful and creative, 
but each of them I did just enough to pay for um, what I what was absolutely needed in art supplies and a fund for my house in the country. <laughs> um, the Lower East Side. I pause. Uh, the Lower East Side was, when we first moved in, um, ugly and frightening and dangerous. And um, there were no trees. Now there are huge, beautiful trees on that street. Um, we were truly pioneers, and we became uh, scruffy, scrapping artists, poets, and my friends were poets. And I became um, very involved. I also write, so I was very involved in the poetry scene at um, the Lower East Side in um, the St. Mark's Poetry Project. And when we had alternate side of the street parking, and I'd have to go and move my car and wait, and I'd be sitting outside of the apartment, and all the poets would come by, and we'd end up talking on the stoop and um, it, it was a wonderful atmosphere because I never had to explain to anyone what I was doing, why I was an artist, why I didn't have a regular job and why I didn't have a station wagon and all the things everyone thought someone should have. Uh, everyone just got it. They were artists and poets and there were always um, we were always making artist books and poetry books, and um, to me, that was more important than living in a fancy house and having all the things that people had. Uh, it nurtured me deeply. So did you find um, that you're bringing uh, your environment into your studio, or is your studio a uh, special isolated place? That's a great question. I was, I um, realized over time that I was very lucky to have an apartment in New York at all. It was 300 square feet. The bathtub was in the kitchen. And um, I was happy that the toilet was in the apartment. <laughs> um, I fixed it up. It was absolutely charming. So where is the studio? Well, the other people had living rooms and bedrooms. But I had a mattress on the floor, and um, I would, um, I would or, I, or the bed, and that was my studio. I would put all my work out on the bed and, and work on my lap. And, you know, now that I have a whole house for the studio, I still sit on the floor and I put everything around me and work that way. Um, I remember <laughs> one day I was sitting and I was doing a pen and ink on the bed and um, I was not being really smart about it and putting it in a, a bigger dish. And so I was, I was working and working, and the cat jumped up, and I went to pet him, and I knocked the ink over on all the bedding. I just took all the bedding out and put it in the sink and washed it off, and then I spread it out on the bed again and started working again. And then the cat jumped up again, and I knocked it over again. And, and that was just... Thing, you know, what went on, but people would say, well, where is your studio? And I'd say, my studio is always where I am. Wherever I am, the studio comes first. Um, often people say to me, I'd, I'd like to work, but I don't have a studio. If, if you really want to work, you find ways to work. So 